Hello, welcome to the Jurassic Park 3 Minutes. We'll be discussing the second Jurassic Park sequel, One Minute at a Time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And on this minute, we'll be discussing Minute 21 of Jurassic Park 3. But before we get to that, David, we um, had something very special come across the social medias in the last couple of days. Yes, we did. I, we, we mentioned a few... I think it would have been November, where uh, we reached out and made contact with Todd Marks, who was... He worked on The Lost World, and uh, he said that he had some special behind-the-scenes stuff. We've seen some of that mm. released so far, but the last couple of days he's sort of posted up a photo of a call sheet. Yeah, he did. In fact, a couple of things from him, his interesting things from him have come in, in the last couple of days. He popped up on the Replica Prop Forum, and there's a member there who's currently doing a... Um, a replica of the Marksman, what was it, the Marksman GPS, the Eddie, uh... Yeah, yeah, Eddie's handheld GPS, yep. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to search for it real quick. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Poses some information, some of the technical, uh, like the, um, some of the stuff that you'd need to recreate it and stuff like that, but I think the most interesting thing he made in that post is that the name Marksman actually comes from a combination of his last name and the last name of Harold and Alex Mann of Mann Consulting in San Francisco who were hired to build the playback graphics. Oh, well. Wow. And they just whipped it up in a uh, gold in like a uh, gold typeface and printed it out and put it on a black piece of paper. Against a black piece of paper. And that's the label that we see in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sort of resembles that sort of Magellan GPS font from memory. Mm. Um, but yeah, and even sort of moving on to the um, the call sheet, like it's just mm. it's great. Um, this is for insert shots for the Lost World for Friday, December sixth, nineteen ninety six. So um, it's the sixty sixth day of filming out of seventy four, which sort of puts it. You get that sort of time frame of. Um, mm like how early the Bowman scene on Sauna was filmed, where we have that that November 11th newspaper or November 12th newspaper, whatever it was. So that was shot at the start of the, start of the production where here we're doing pick-up shots or insert shots towards the very end, some of which on the back lot, some of which on uh, stage 27, stage 22, and stage 24. Some interesting ones here, I'll mention a couple... They had to retake a couple of photos of or a couple of shots of um, the GPS in Eddie's hand, one moving and one not. Which I suppose that shot in Eddie's hand while moving is the one we get in the final, the final film because you're sort of moving around, you can't get a, a good clear shot at it unless you've mm -hmm. got the Blu-ray now. But a couple of other things on the back lot too. You've got um, uh, the the Raptor when it gets kicked out of the kiln house. Mm -hmm. That's on that's on the stage, but um, there's a uh, insert shot of it falling in amongst the piping for the power plant that wasn't in the film. They must have reshot that on that and used that um, it falling on the wood or the debris from the window that got kicked out. And one interesting one here too. It must be from when um, Roland and RJ are tracking the Tyrannosaur, but you get a um, Roland's POV of a bloody leaf mm -hmm. that was meant to be a insert, insert shot on the jungle trail. Any other there? Any others there that are sort of jumping out? Um. I think it's interesting that they give that there's no given official last name here for Kelly's character. I mean, we got Ian Malcolm, Sarah Harding, Nick Van Owen, Peter Ludlow, Roland Tembo, and then there's just Kelly. Yeah, no, I just noticed that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's interesting that they've only named Kelly by Kelly and not um, last name. Yeah, no Malcolm, no Curtis, nothing. Hmm. Yeah, that is that is very interesting. Very interesting, because <laughs> um, yeah, the, the cast and day players for the uh, scenes they're doing insert shots, of course, and Sarah Kelly, Nick, Peter, or yeah, Peter Ludlow and Roland Tembo, and then three of the stunt or the stunt director and two stunt guys. Because one of those shots too is of the um, the close up of the winch when the hunter fires mm -hmm. at the Pachycephalosaurus, um, or the close up of the hunter's gun anyway. But it's just great scenes, more like some of this stuff come out. Even though it's just something simple like a call sheet, but it's sort of interesting that some of that stuff, like the um, like the 
the grassy plain, like the GPS in his hand was all done on the back lot and not on um, not up at Eureka. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I'll have to look at the uh, background next time because now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think you actually see any of the trees. You just see a sunny sky or mm. blue sky with some clouds in it, I think. Well, I'm trying to think too to that deleted scene where you have Ian, Eddie, and Nick sort of in the, the scrubby bush there where I think Ian, uh, Nick suggests splitting up. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of it's sort of it's where that scene goes into where we got the shot of um, Eddie holding the GPS and I'm the, with all the power cables then on the ground. It, it it seems like it's just sort of off to the side of the operations building somewhere in that sort of shrubby. Um, bit of overgrowth area there but could be yeah i mean there's all kinds of tricks uh to movie making as we've <laughs> discussed plenty of times on the show so there's i mean there's all kinds of ways they could have made stuff look like other stuff yeah yeah the one thing i think is interesting is that there's a shot here that's not in the movie but it's labeled here and it's a woman t- actually taking the gun out of the case before putting it together. And we see, I believe that's in the script, where we see uh, Roland actually taking the gun out of the case and explaining to Ludlow the uh, about the gun, about how it was his grandfather's given him to him by some guy. Yeah, it was definitely in the pro-San Diego script. Um, but again, like, that all happened while they were at Eureka... <laughs> on the side of the game trail there, mm-hmm. so but it, it the pickup shot for that or the insert shot for here says the back lot, so No, I mean they could have easily just taken one of the Jeeps and stuck it on a uh stuck it in some field and you'd never notice the difference, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, I'm just sure have the it back. was a close up shot. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you just have the background a bit fuzzy, blurred out, <laughs> so you can't really see what's behind them. Oh, yeah, I mean that would come with the depth of field or you just don't show the background, you know? Yeah, yep. And then the way you edit, would edit it into the film was you'd see the shot of him standing there in uh, the Redwoods, then you'd see a close-up of the gun, then a shot of him putting it together back in the Redwoods, and you never know, know the difference, you know? Yeah, yep. Well, yeah, that's it. There's a lot of those tricks that are already in the film <laughs> exactly. that they use. Exactly. I mean, there's, there's scenes in, in these movies where one, where one character is actually technically at a completely different location miles away from where the other character is and you're made to think they're having the, a conversation in the same spot yeah yep yep the magic of filmmaking yep and then it together to make it look like they're having a conversation I mean it's the things you can do with movies is just out of his mind I guess that's the, why they call it Hollywood magic though right hmm <laughs> yep let's try the toothbrush can you fly one of those maybe as long as the sale's not torn. Well, let's take it. Um, anything else on that you want to discuss before we get into today's minute? Yeah, I think we're good. As we ended minute 20 of Jurassic Park 3, Amanda was calling Ben and Eric's name through the bullhorn. Grant and Billy had come out of the plane, and Grant told Paul that she shouldn't be making that much noise, and it's a very bad idea, and then we get the ominous roar of a large animal. As we open on minute 21... Udeski and Nash come sprinting from the jungle. Udeski yelling at the group, we have to leave, right now. At the nine second mark, Nash has overtaken Udeski and ran straight into the plane, getting ready to fire her up. As Udeski pushes Billy and Grant onto the plane, Billy asks, what about the other guy? Udeski replies, Cooper's a professional, he can handle himself, just as gunshots echo through the jungle again, followed by a roar. At the 25 second mark, as Udeski pulls the door closed, Nash has got the engines fired up and the plane begins to move straight away, turning around and pointing back down the runway from where it had come. At the 40 second mark, as the plane powers down the runway, we cut inside the jungle as Cooper is running through the ferns back towards the airstrip, holding his arm. At the 50 second mark, Cooper emerges on the end of the airstrip and starts waving his hand as he sees the airplane approaching. Everyone on the plane can see him, but Nash doesn't slow down. And as the minute ends, Cooper is saying stop to himself. The look of despair and fear on his face. As we end the last minute, Amanda's sort of been told off for yelling through the ball horn that it was a bad idea, and we get the roar from the animal, and then we hear several gunshots. 
Amanda watches Udesky and then Nash come running out of the jungle and <laughs> Udesky cries out, We have to leave, we have to leave right now. Yeah. As they both run right now. Run, right now. We, we gotta yep. go. <laughs> <laughs> and both run past her and head straight for the plane, which it sort of does make you wonder or with the, the loud or the, the loud roar we heard before, we know it's a large animal and they've obviously taken a couple of shots at it and really mm-hmm. pissed it off and yeah. know that they can't stop it, so the best thing to do now is to get in the plane and get out of there. We never actually see what is there, and uh, we never actually see any like gunshot wounds or anything on the dinosaur, on the I mean on the Spinosaurus. So we don't don't know if they actually hit it or if they just kind of shot at it and missed. Well, yeah, and we're we're going to touch on that again too when the plane does take off and draw blood on the Spinosaur. You never see that damage either. True. Um, which is always. Well, actually, um, no, wait, no, you do, you do. Oh, do you? Yeah, it's on the, both the CGI model and the animatronic, you do see um, a gash at the hip uh, okay. where the plane would have hit it. Because I know there had been some speculation among fans before that perhaps this was the um, the female and the one we get chasing them later is the male. No, and that's why no. it's so hell bent is because you just killed their mate. <laughs> yeah, I, I have heard that as well, but no, you do see the gash on the leg or it's, it's more like I round on the thigh where they the plane strike struck it and then the obviously I mean they didn't I mean the blood mostly hit on the windshield so mm-hmm. yeah that's yeah. all right we'll get to that next minute that's <laughs> when it all <laughs> comes into it but they rejoin the group at the plane Nash doesn't miss a beat as he runs straight up the cockpit <laughs> and quickly gets into the plane and saying get into the plane get into the plane get into the plane over and over as he's running and the uh, the others all sort of climb in behind him. We cut to inside the plane as Nash hurries up quickly to send aisle towards the cockpit and outside Billy and Grant have been pretty much being pushed up the ladder by Udesky, which <laughs> it's very good of him to sort of get them on board before himself. <laughs> well, after what he's just seen, you'd think he'd be the first one on behind Nash and more worried about getting the plane off the ground than what the uh, others are doing. Because <laughs> it could be their fault if they late, stay behind. <laughs> he told him to get on the plane. But uh, Billy asks, what about the other guy? As they go up the ladder and Udesky replies that Cooper's a professional, he can handle himself. Just as another roar's heard and another gunshot echoes out of the jungle again. <laughs> Which, I don't... You could be a professional anything, I don't think you're going to be prepared. With dealing <laughs> with the Spinosaur. <laughs> as they climb into the plane, Udesky closes the door behind him and everyone takes a seat and Nash fires up the plane's engines. And uh, the plane turns around. At the start of the scene... When we're here, we've seen the plane parking point down the long runway and it seemed to stretch away for a good mile or so in front of it towards those mountains where the power lines were. And sort of now you can assume that they're turning around this building and that's in the middle of the airstrip and then the airstrip's probably going to go a mile back the other way as well. Mm. Um, just especially how long it takes for the plane to take off. But sort of briefly looking at runways in general, for a plane under... 200,000 pounds or 90 tonnes, the standard runway length's 600 feet or 1.8 kilometres, which this plane's definitely, for that, sort of suits this size size runway. Planes over that size, you need about 8,000 feet or 2.4 kilometres, and that's at sea level. Of course, uh, altitudes change as um, Mm -hmm. runways need to be longer, but um, since it's a military uh, runway, it would need to be long enough for military transports yeah. Um, so it's possible that this is this could be one of the main ways since we've never seen a harbour this could be one of the main ways they actually got mm-hmm. building materials and that onto the island was with sort of cargo planes because the runway is long enough yeah they could have been just trucked them through the jungle to uh, mm. wherever they needed to be because I mean we do see the Eric's water truck later in the movie kind of just sitting there in the middle of the jungle <laughs> didn't just like land there so i'm assuming that there must have been a road there at some point well yeah and we'll get to when we get to the lab the lab when all that stuff when they leave in the both the novel and the script they actually leave through the rear through um the lab mm-hmm. compound there's actual construction equipment parked there which um I'm, it's a pity we didn't get that in the film but um it would have answered a few more questions like especially about what we see later with the marina and that but but it also it also means too that a corporate jet, Ludlow's corporate jet, could have easily landed on this runway and had the uh, had the um had the distance to take off either way. Mm-hmm. And even where um when you're looking at the runway 
just beside the or between the main building and the abandoned work truck, there's a sign up with 15, which most runways have the sort of the, the distance signs along their length. And yeah. this 15 could be 1.5 miles. It could be, it could be that could like how at what point along the runway they're at that the 1.5 mile mark, which most most runways have. So. I was going to say, I do think it's interesting, I'm just checking out some of the screen caps here, is that in the trees that Cooper runs out of, when we're looking at him running out onto the air onto the airfield, we do, I can see a some planes, uh, like an open space between that airfield and on the other side of the tree, so it could have been possible that they were shooting at something out in the open. Yeah. Yep. Well, then that and uh, yeah, that's something else when we get to there too. So this whole whole scene of them going in the jungle, encountering the Spinosaur, and then coming back, mm-hmm. we know very little about. We did they come across its nest? Was it out there drinking? Was it like even yes, it might have been attracted by the bullhorn, but I don't. Being an animal, I don't see it just running straight towards the sound like it would have been cautious approaching. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's probably no way that I mean. Even most large predators, unless they know that you could, that they could take you down, which to be honest, I mean, a spinosaurus probably would know that. <laughs> would um, try would try would otherwise leave you alone. I mean, especially if it's not hungry, there's no reason that a lion would just attack you. Yeah, well, even going back to the original Jurassic Park, when the Tyrannosaur comes out of the jungle behind Muldoon and um, Ellie in the Jeep, like it comes out, looks left and right. It's only when Muldoon gasses the engine and takes off, it looks directly at him and starts giving chase. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's another true thing as well, is that a lot, uh, most animals will give chase to you if you're, um, if you're moving. I mean, there's animals out there that will completely ignore a stationary target, but if you run from it, that's when it gives chase. Hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why, I mean, even if you're on herbivores, you're not supposed to, like, run at them, because they'll, they'll take a defensive stance and, and then charge it back at you. Well, you hear that all the time when there's deer on the road, or big animals like that, where people are told not to drive up to them and beep your horn, because they'll turn around and ram the front of your car and set the airbag well, off. That, well, that actually happened to me. Well, not, I didn't get rammed by one today, but I was trying to... Um, Get some. I was out in the forest today. It was snowing, and I come up to I come up to two deer, a duck and a. I mean, uh, a duck, <laughs> a buck and a doe. <laughs> and <Deadly> so, ducks. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm trying to quietly get as close to them as possible to get a good shot, and and all of a sudden they just bolt, and I look yeah. behind me and there's a duck guy coming up with his dog, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Cutting back inside the aeroplane, everyone's putting their seatbelts on as Udesky tries to walk up the aisle as the plane swings around and he's having a bit of <laughs> a bit of a trouble walking up the aisle. But um, we cut to a man and she's upset and um, the upset that they're leaving and mounts the pole we can't, but he reassures her saying it's okay, we'll circle the island. Udesky gets into the cockpit and straps in or sits down and helps Nash with his seatbelt as um, Nash throttles up the engines for takeoff. Which is sort of they're clearly trying to get the takeoff speed here when he throws it throttle forward but in sort of novel in the script it's sort of just taxiing to the end of the runway which sort of doesn't make much sense when it needs to hit the Spinosaur then crash I think what I believe they did was they came in and went to the end of the runway turned the plane around and then took off you know yeah yeah because I believe that's what is described in the in the uh, script in the novel is that they had to go back to the end of the runway to get enough um, runway to take off. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But we, um, we cut into the jungle as Cooper's running for sort of a nice, uh, we don't get much of it, but sort of that dark misty foliage. Yeah. The fog in that there as well. And he's holding his arm, which is interesting, but, uh, it's clearly in, Im, in, imaged. It's clearly in, uh, injured, and we see that in the next couple of minutes too, where he's standing there holding his arm and not really moving it. But um, inside the plane, everyone's holding on as it accelerates forward. 
if you look at the uh, uh, still of it, it almost looks like there's also some uh, scratches on his face and neck as well. So I'm wondering if he was just run running through the foliage and he somehow hurt his arm and face when running through the foliage. I mean, because you run through a forest, you, you're going to get whacked by branches and stuff, you know? Well, yeah, my thought too is that he's ran into a tree. <laughs> he's been panic stricken and ran into a tree or something. But... He could have been. He could have, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Because if... he doesn't, even later on, he, like, he doesn't move that arm at all. He can't. It just dangles by his side. So it's, it seems like he's broken a collarbone or broken something or strained something pretty badly. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that is a, I mean, among the mysteries of Jurassic, of this movie, this is another one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, they, they, we just never get an answer to it, and we probably never will. No. <laughs> Cooper emerges from the jungle, and he's a, he's a fair distance away from where the park was, the plane was parked originally. <laughs> well, he's almost at the end of the runway here, which is sort of odd because this end of the runway is the end that sort of comes out onto the main runway. So all that tree, all those trees, and that behind him must be CG'd in. Mm. Yeah, that's true, because, I mean, otherwise there would just be straight ocean out there, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 you'd see a clear view to the ocean behind him. Yeah. But he puts his hand up, he puts his good hand up in the air and starts to wave to the plane, but um, inside the plash, inside the plane, Nash and Udesky see him, but Cooper's yelling to stop, and um, Grant sees him all and says, hey, that's a Cooper, which after he just punched him, you'd think he'd be, yeah, well, <laughs> die. Yeah, but I mean... I'm sure he doesn't want to just leave.